All right. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Whitney Rinaldi. I am the Family Service Coordinator here at the Foundation, and I am very excited to welcome you to our webinar on speech language and AAC devices. Um, just a few things. First, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping. Um, again, the uh, webinar will be recorded today. So please make sure if you do not want to be um, visible, just keep your camera off. Um, we also request that everybody stay muted during the presentation. We will be having a question and answer at the end of the presentation. So please, as the presentation is happening, if you have a question, please don't hesitate, put it right into the chat box and we'll make sure to get through those questions during the question and answer section. Again, also, if your question does not get answered uh, due to limited time, we request that you go to the CDLS website. You can fill out an Ask the Expert form, and we will make sure that both Saray and Patty, our co-hosts today, receive those and can send answers to you. Um, so again, um, if there's any questions after the webinar, you can reach out to myself and Linda. She's also present today. We're part of the family service team here at the foundation. And you can reach out to us by email, you can see on the screen, or our phone number. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our presenters today. First, we have Patty Caudill, Clinical Assistant Faculty at the Department of Speech, Language, Pathology, and Audiology at Townsend University, as well as a member of our Clinical Advisory Board today. And we also have Saray Whedon-Shannon, our assisted, Assistive Technology Specialist, at the public school system in Maryland. Uh, so thank you both for um, joining us today and I'm gonna pass it right over to you guys. So Patty, you're muted. Thank you, Whitney. I'm gonna go ahead and do a little housekeeping on this end and share our screen, our presentation today. We are so excited to be with you today. It's always a privilege uh, to be with the foundation and people from the foundation. And today we're talking about AAC, communication options for individuals with CDLS. And in terms of disclosures, we have no relevant disclosures, except I do have a grant through the CDLS Foundation to do some survey work uh, in the area of AAC, and we'll discuss that at the end of the presentation today. So in terms of our agenda for the day to keep us on track, we're going to be talking about what is AAC, what does the research tell us, address some AAC myths, talk about types of devices and some features, how do you pay for a device, some general recommendations in this area, and also save some time to answer some questions. Mary Poppins in The Sound of Music says, where do I start? And we start at the very beginning, and the very beginning is what is AAC? And AAC is an acronym for a lot of things. It stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. And it's an alternative to an individual's current communication methods. And it can also be used as a supplement to their current communication methods, even for those individuals who are verbal and speaking some words. And I like to think of it as a bridge. It's a way to bridge the gap between what it is that I want to say and what it is that I'm able to express. AAC lets people communicate beyond what their basic wants and needs are, but also to express feelings, tell us how they really feel about things and express some opinions, build relationships between people that are important to them, and also to build language and literacy skills academically. And who can use AAC? What's the eligibility criteria? And it's simply who can't meet their communication needs in all the situations that they wish to be communicating in. 
And I think that the communication gaps are well known um, with regard to CDLS with this group that, that's gathered here today. Uh, there are some individuals who speak and there are some individuals who speak well in a way that can be understood. And then there are other individuals that are speaking but are very difficult to, to understand because of their speech. And then we have other individuals who are not speaking or minimally speaking words and that they communicate and they express themselves in other ways. But that expression is limited. They can't communicate all the things that they wish to communicate as we talked about a moment ago. And that we also see impact on social communication. How am I communicating with other people? And I may be communicating quite well at home, but when I go out into the community or at school or at work, I have difficulty communicating in those situations. A lot of the research in this area has been done uh, with individuals who are autist autistic and with individuals who have global developmental disabilities. And that research tells us that AAC is beneficial in terms of increasing individuals' overall speech language abilities. And specifically, we're looking at increasing the number of words and increasing the number of words that are spoken at a time in terms of a sentence. Um, increasing understanding of language, particularly in young children, increasing speech and verbalizations in autistic individuals, and also in decreasing frustration, negative behaviors, acting out behaviors that are related to communication. But when we get back to the area of AAC and, and specifically individuals with CDLS, we're finding that there's very minimal research in this area. And if I look at Imoni, um, who in 2014 with her colleagues over in Italy, uh, was working with a group of 17 individuals with CDLS, and out of those 17 individuals, only four had, had the opportunity to participate in an AAC assessment. The group that she was looking at were individuals between two to 13 years old. And looking at that number of four, she found that those individuals had increased understanding and use of vocabulary and improved attention skills. The recommendations that Ioni, um, Imoni, excuse me, proposed were early AAC intervention and a need to find novel approaches given how complex CDLS is. And she put forth this idea of wide augmented communication input. And basically what that means is a language immersion approach where you're looking at the use of AAC, not just at school and not just in a therapy room, but throughout the whole context of an individual's life at school, at work, recreational use, in the community, as well as during therapy. And it is very important to involve everyone in, in the plan, all the communication partners in that individual's life, especially the family. So we have a little bit of experience in terms of looking at what's going on with AAC through the, our experiences in the, the Baltimore CDLS clinic and families who have been very generous in terms of sharing their experiences with with us. And retrospectively, looking at individuals who came to the clinic between 2016 and 2019 that we were able to collect enough information on, we were able to report out of this group of 20 individuals who were between two and 30 years old with a mean age of 15 and a half years, more females than males, that they used a variety of communication methods. And some individuals use more than one method, so these numbers will add up to more than 20. And about half the individuals would use sounds and vocalizations. About a third of the individuals were, were speaking using words or words and phrases. About a third of the individuals signed. Uh, several of the individuals would use guiding or gesturing to communicate. And then one parent reported that they, their individual used facial expressions primarily to, to communicate. 
And then if we look on the other side of the screen, we look at things that we, we typically refer to as AAC methods. So that one was using an object box and this box was used only at school. And if the individual wanted to take a walk while they were at school, they would go to the object box and they would pull up the object that they had learned to associate with walk, for example. Another individual is using a modified PEC system, which is a picture exchange communication system and was no longer using that. And we also had individuals using a touch chat app on an iPad, or they would point to or select between two items. So if we look at this entire group, 80% of the group was identified as being nonverbal or mentally verbal. But if we look on the other side of the screen, we see that 23% of this group had been exposed to and using a device. 15% used the device only at school. So there seems to be a gap here. And, and why is there this gap? This gap is especially interesting because when we talk to these same caregivers, these same families, they tell us that many of our individuals with CDLS are using devices to communicate what they want recreationally. So for example, they're using the iPad or they're using a Fire tablet or an iPod or a smartphone or even the remote control to communicate what it is that they want. Some are using the camera icon, finding it, taking a picture, swiping through pictures, finding and playing through games. There was one individual who was using an iPod, I can't use an iPod, uh, to select music, uh, using pictures or words on a smartphone to make telephone calls, finding the YouTube icon and selecting a favorite movie to watch or even moving over toward the media center at home and looking at two DVDs and selecting the one that they wanted to watch. Saray, are you still with us? Hi, yes, I'm still here. I'm turning it over to you. All right, um, I'm just troubleshooting on my end. Um, Thank you so much, Patty. And so as Patty has shared, there's lots of options for augmentative and alternative communication. Um, but unfortunately, families um, and professionals have heard many myths that act as roadblocks um, to access. And so we're gonna discuss some of the myths that you may have heard and what the research actually says about AAC. And you can go ahead to the next slide when you're ready. All right, so um, the myth is that AAC will keep someone from talking. And in my role as an assistive technology specialist um, working for a, pu a public school district, I hear this all the time. I'm interested in this means of communication, but I'm worried that he's going to rely on this or that she's going to rely on this method and that therefore she will not verbally communicate. Um, and what the research lets us know is that that's actually not true. Um, several studies have shown us that when introduced to AAC, children and adults become more verbal. They have increases in speech production after that introduction to AAC. And 89% of the individuals that were part of the study um, that Miller, Light, and Schlosser did in 2006, 11% 11 11 had no change at all. And there was no one who had a decrease in their verbal production of speech. So if that was a concern that you had or concern that you heard, you can kind of put that to rest. We'll go to the next one. Um, another one that I hear pretty frequent, oops, sorry, if, if you all can't see me, please let me know because I'm on a phone due to my tech issues and I see that my video is going in and out. So um, just let me know. Going back to my slides, sorry. Um, AAC is not um, 
needed if the individual has a few words. Um, and we know that this is also not true. Um, a few words does not demonstrate or does not provide the full put communication potential of that individual. Um, so you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, we don't want our, our, our family members, our loved ones to have to communicate with this uh, limited um, speech. We want them to have the full capacity of the beauty of their language. So it doesn't allow for them to become independent communicators. It doesn't allow for them to have full relationships with family members and friends. And, and it doesn't allow for um, independence and, and language growth. So the research tells us that you can go back uh, a little bit. The research tells us by that by 18 months, when exposed to AAC, a child can typically produce 50 words and then start combining words. My background, um, like Patty, is as a speech language pathologist, and so we know in our field that having 50 words is a huge benchmark, right? When we get to 50 words, we look for our children to start making word combinations to make some phrases and sentences with their verbal speech. The same is true with AAC. And typically developing preschoolers, they're, they're usually picking up about nine words a day. We want our AAC users to be able to have access to language so that they can pick up the same amount of words each day. Um, so just because one has a severe communication impairment, it doesn't mean that they can't establish relationships, that they can't have new knowledge or thoughts. And I always um, like to talk about my, my students or my clients that I've worked with over the years that have gone on to get married, that have gone on to have jobs, that have gone on to have these lifelong friendships um, because of the beauty of AAC and having this really complex, rich language system. When you're ready, Patty. And then this, I like to um, thank uh, Dynavox, which is one of our AAC systems. This is one of the, our Dynavox representatives. Um, she has given, um, supported me over the years with some research, um, some of the research that I'm providing with you. Um, um, uh, she's helped me with. Um, and so this is her working with an AAC user. Um, and one of the myths is that a child is too young or an individual is too old to use AAC. So sometimes we'll see, oh, I just want to, we just want to wait another year. Let's, let's not jump the gun. Let's not go too fast. Let's wait and see what happens. And that's really not the best case scenario. You can feel free to move forward, Patty. The research lets us know that because of the positive impact that AAC has on verbal speech production, and because there is no prerequisites for AAC, there is no skills that have to be demonstrated before you can try AAC, that that wait and see approach is really not what's best. You don't wanna wait for someone to fail at another means of communication because we're all multimodal communicators. For instance, I often speak with my hands, um, I text, I verbally speak, um, I use eye contact and facial expressions. And so we wanna make sure that our AAC users have access to all of the modalities of communication that they may want to use. That's verbal speech, that might be low tech, like picture boards or manual sign, maybe some words. And then maybe they're using their AAC device to augment or to really kind of explain things that were misunderstood, or maybe it's their primary means of communication. So because communication and language development impact the advancement of literacy skills, of their cognitive skills, skills, problem solving, all of those things, we want to make sure that they have access as early as possible and, and up until whatever age is necessary. So I have done AAC assessments for very young children, as young as one. And I have done AAC assessments for my most recent one with a 93-year-old. There's no too young or no too old to access language. All right, and then Patty kind of touched on this. Um, I've heard this before from teachers um, and sometimes from 
well-meaning professionals that um, this child has too many challenging behaviors for AAC to be successful. And that is that actually not evidence-based also. What the research tells us is that AAC provides positive behavior support. It increases the positive behavior because you're now giving the individual a means to effectively communicate all of the things that they've been feeling, all the frustrations that they've had, but have not had a means to effectively communicate. So what we see is a reduce in those problem behaviors and success rates nearly double when intervention is based on a prior functional assessment. So what that means is you have to have a functional assessment of behavior. That plan has to be implemented with the functional communication and you have to have intervention to address it. It's not a magic wand. So there has to be quality intervention and you'll see those positive behavior supports widely applicable to people um, with um, serious behavior challenges. Um, what I shared with you, and I'm not going to go through this entire um, document, but what I shared with you is an, uh, a document that can be helpful for individuals that are wondering, would my family member benefit from AAC? And just as Patty said, anytime someone is not effectively communicating in all settings, the answer is yes, right? We actually all use a form of augmentative and alternative communication every single day via texting, via picture supports. So the answer is always they could benefit, but do I need to go through the process of an evaluation and procuring a device? Um, this, this document here can help you. So it's a quick and easy screening tool that can be completed by a professional staff, as well as the family members to kind of guide if, and I don't like to use the word candidate because that term we don't actually, we actually say everyone is a candidate for AAC, but it's really for those who it's never been considered before. Okay, so really if there's some settings where they're not communicating as effectively as they can, then this is a nice tool that you can use um, for screening. Okay. All right, and so we'll quickly go through this and Patty, feel free to jump in. Um, so some types of AAC and that you all may already be utilizing some of this with your family member and your loved one. Um, and that's a communication board or, uh, and that's like a paper-based board um, that helps you, um, one to point to pictures or it could be, I'm, I'm pointing to tactile objects to help me communicate, um, buttons or switches that they're using. So a one hit or two hit message um, communicator can be like a button or an easy switch that we use to help. Um, communication apps, um, that those are typically not dedicated devices. So you may be familiar with ProLoquo or Touch Chat or Lamp Words for Life. Those can come in a non-dedicated form or a dedicated form or on a speech generating device. And what a speech generating device is, is that a communication device that is dedicated to communication and you really can't access any other functions on the dedicated device besides communication. And Patty, feel free to jump in if there's anything I missed. Oh, I can't hear you, Patty. Thank you, Saray. I'm going to stop sharing and then um, I think you have some additional things you would like to share with us. Well, I'm at actually having some trouble with my tech right now. So I'm going to keep working on that. Okay. Um, and then so I'll just keep going you, forward. Can, yes, I'll keep working on that. And then I'll um, share my last couple of things. Give me just a moment here to catch up. So in terms of how do you obtain a device, you can obtain a device after an evaluation. 
And that evaluation can occur a lot of places. That evaluation can occur at school, um, particularly a public school. And some of you may have a device that has been provided to your individual through the school. Sometimes we find that the schools don't allow those devices to come home. And then other times other schools do allow devices to come home. If you do have a device that is provided by your public school, we suggest that you have a conversation with the school in terms of allowing that device to be used in all situations and not just at school. You also have the opportunity to have a device provided uh, through insurance if your child has insurance. Uh, it's or your adult. It's covered by Medicare as part of durable medical equipment. And again, that term is speech generating device. And most private insurances do follow Medicare. Medicaid coverage uh, tends to vary state by state, but there typically is some sort of coverage under Medicaid medical assistance as well. And then we also see variation, not only with private insurances, but with specific insurances um, for federal employees, that there is oftentimes an exclusion or there could be dollar limits that apply to any of the insurances. To be covered by insurance, insurance requires that there's a formal AAC evaluation and that has to occur with a speech language pathologist. And there are fairly strict rules in terms of the documentation provided to the insurance company for consideration of coverage so that when you're working with a speech pathologist on AAC, you want to make sure that person is very well versed in how to complete documentation that is acceptable to insurance companies. One thing that insurance companies frequently require is that at least three, if not more, different types of methods and or devices are trialed and that the response, the individual's response to each trial, whether it's to something that's more low tech like a communication board or a picture exchange system, or something that is more high tech, such as a, an app on a non-dedicated device, like an iPad or a, or a tablet, um, or a speech generating device, a dedicated device, that the only thing that device does is allow that individual to communicate. Those have to be very carefully documented. So in 2004, the Assistive Technology Act was signed. And those of us working with individuals with disabilities were really excited about that because what happened was is that technology centers were established in every state. And I provided a link here for you. If you go to that link, it can tell you where the technology center or centers are in your state. And at the technology centers, they have specialist in all types of assisted technology, including AAC. They provide lending libraries, information on funding, and sometimes they have individuals at those centers who can complete evaluations for you. And then the Affordable Care Act in 2010 uh, also added specific protections against disability discrimination, which also they help to increase access to speech generating devices through insurance. The Steve Gleason Act was something that recently, more recently um, passed, went through Congress and was signed by the president. And when we look at individuals with CDLS as a whole, we know that there are groups of individuals that have sensory disabilities as well as the uh, speech language communication issues. And those sensory disabilities can be visual or they can be related to hearing. We have individuals with motor coordination issues and limb malformations. Many of these individuals can benefit from specific accessories that can be used with devices to help with selecting words on the device or to help with hearing words on the device. Um, or so these are now funded by third party payers. And then you'll find that they're out there, but they're a little bit more challenging to find. Are these 
limited additional public funding grant streams. So for example, in Maryland, we have something that's called LIST funding through the Developmental Disabilities Administration. And uh, LIST stands for Low Intensity Support Services, and they will provide uh, limited funding for something special. For, so for example, they may help pay for the copay on a device. And in some situations, they might pay for uh, the cost of the apps to download onto an uh, iPad or onto a tablet. So I encourage you to investigate those in your area as well. In terms of some general recommendations, Look for an AAC specialist for evaluation. You want to make certain that your individual is getting a, a very individualized evaluation and not a, I give everyone this device or I have everyone download this app. Because ev just as um, we have this wide range of abilities and interests and strengths, and needs, these devices can support different people in different ways. And so you want a very highly individualized evaluation and not a one device fits all. You want to make certain that those multiple communication options are considered during the evaluation so that your individual ends up with the best fit of a device, but also to assist with uh, insurance coverage as required. I am a big proponent, and I know Saray is as well, as having a voice output feature that what happens is, is that when you input what it is that you would like to express, when you hit um, the voice output button, it will repeat and say out loud what it is that your individual has just selected. And that's a really nice feature for communication in terms of that back and forth communication, but it's also a really wonderful learning model for individuals who are starting to imitate speech. Interview the SLP prior to meeting with them, prior to the evaluation. Feel free, I appreciate it when people interview me and ask me questions. Uh, to make certain that I'm the right fit for them. Ask them about what their AAC experience is. How many evaluations do you do every year? How do you stay current on what's new in the technology? Because since we started this webinar, I would be willing to bet something in the technology has already changed. Ask about the types of AAC methods that they recommend and that they use. And what you're looking for is that they're not just telling you one thing, that there's that wide breadth of devices, of methods that they consider when they complete an evaluation. And then also ask if AAC is recommended, what support is provided following the evaluation and following the receipt of the device? who's going to teach the individual how to use it, what additional supports are needed, how are you going to use, learn to use the device so that you can support your family member in communicating with this device, who's collaborating with the school, with the OT, with the PT, with the job coach on the work site. Uh, that's really important to make sure that that individual remains maybe not part of the daily plan, but it's available to help communicate and get everyone on the same page and learn how to use the device and put forth a plan that will help uh, this individual be successful. If there's a long waiting list, look for other options. Consider a local university speech language clinic. There is frequently an AAC specialist on staff. ASHA is our, the American Speech Language Hearing Association. They have a ProFind uh, website where you can find speech pathologists who have identified themselves as experts in the field of AAC. And then you can also go to uh, the uh, societies for AAC, uh, USS AAC and IS. AAC, and if you go to those sites, 
you can search both nationally and also internationally for specialists in this area. And lastly, if you're in the United States, you can look for your state's speech language pathology association. They also have a similar find a speech pathologist who specializes in AAC function so that you can find someone who's more local to you. Make certain that comprehensive plan is put together for providing instruction and helping the individual learn how to use this new AAC method. Have your team in place. And as a family member, you are critical to the success of this. It's not something that can happen somewhere else and then happen at home. It's something that everyone needs to be actively involved in. Family, the speech pathologist, the teacher, the job coach, the OT, the, P, the PT, and as Saray referred to, behavioral support services. Encourage the individual to use AAC in all environments not just at school, not just in the therapy room, not just at the, the job site, but in all the environments that the individual uh, participates in. Talk about things that are motivating and interesting and novel and that will make use of the device. I can shake my head to answer yes or no. I don't need a device to push the button yes or no. If I'm very efficient at signing that I want to eat something, I don't need a device that I can push the eat button on, but it might be helpful if I had a menu of foods. Eat, what do you want to eat? Hmm, pizza, barbecued ribs, applesauce, cookies. Make sure that the vocabulary in the device is functional, but also motivating based upon what the individual's daily life is like. So several years ago, I, I met an individual at, at uh, a CDLS clinic, and this was a, a young adult. And the young adult had used a dedicated speech generating device all through school and was no longer wanting to use this device. It had a handle on it. It came in a nice big box so that it was very sturdy. And in talking with the family, the family felt that it seemed that the adult felt different using this device and that they had downloaded an app on an iPad and that the individual was starting to use the app, but wasn't really fully invested and interested in using the app. And in looking at the app, a lot of the vocabulary on the app no longer was applicable to her life situation. She was out of school. She was hanging out with friends. She was starting to work uh, in, in a job for a few hours every week. What we recommended was uh, a reevaluation uh, for AAC, looking specifically at uh, what device is the best device for her going forward, particularly um, a appreciating what her personal views were in terms of using a device that maybe was different than what you and I use in everyday life in terms of picking up our iPad or picking up our smartphone and communicating with other people, but also aging up on the vocabulary to use a vocabulary similar to, to the the type of vocabulary that she wished to be able to express instead of the school age girl vocabulary. Accept all communication attempts. When learning a new language, we don't stop speaking in the old language. We learn the new language by scaffolding it or adding it on top of the old language. And that helps us continue to grow in both languages. And that's true with AAC as well. So accept all communication modalities. If your individual wishes to sign, wonderful. Speak, yes, vocalizations, guide you, facial expressions, 
while at the very same time continuing to encourage use of the device and positively reinforcing all communication attempts. That helps communication grow as a whole. And then reassess progress and make changes. I'm looking, Saray, how are we doing with the technical issues on your end? Um, yeah, I'm still having challenges with my iPad. Um, so I think we can move into question and answer. Okay. Hi, as people have questions, please um, put them in the chat box. Um, we do have a few and I'll um, start looking at them now. The first one is, um, what are some important qualifications I should look for when I'm trying to find an um, trying to find assistive technology? So, are you looking for qualifications of the professional, or qualifications that your your loved one skills your loved one should have? Um, and I'll just answer regarding the professional. Um, to have an assistive technology assessment, a speech language pathologist will have to be a part of the team. Sometimes you'll have a, a several members of the team who take to take part in the assessment. So if your loved one has any physical challenges, fine motor challenges, access difficulty, you would want to have an occupational therapist. Um, who has experience with AAC and that would always be a question that I would very blatantly ask, please share with me your experience with AAC, with AAC assessments. How many years have you been doing this? Um, tell me what types of devices you work with, um, what types of vendors and your success with getting the device procured. So if there's any fine motor issues, occupational therapists, if there's any mobility or gross motor issues, you would want to have a physical therapist who has experience with assistive technology or AAC. Um, if they need the device mounted to a wheelchair, you need that physical therapist plus the speech therapist to work with work with that. Um, so again, you want you want to make sure you have professionals that have experience with AAC. But legally, what you're required to have is a special as a speech language pathologist um, who um, is licensed to complete the assessment. And Patty, anything you want to add to that? I think you covered that well. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Our next question is um, between apps on a. Um, hold on a second. I didn't realize someone. Okay, between apps on a non-dedicated device like an iPad versus a dedicated device that only speech is accessed on, is one more successful than the other? And what would be more beneficial? Is there any research between the two? Yeah, and um, Patty, I can answer, and then I'd love to get your input too. Um, so it honestly, it depends on what you have access to. Um, I have definitely had success with clients who have uh, used communication apps on an iPad, but it functions as a dedicated device. And what that means is all other apps have been removed. And they so there's not any playing apps, there's no break time apps on that device, right? And that's the most important thing. This is for communication and communication only. So that's what you want to make sure that your loved one understands. Um, now, I do, I technically prefer a dedicated device because you're going to get a full and comprehensive assessment with a dedicated device versus sometimes with the app, you do not always get a dedicated, full and comprehensive dedicated assessment. But there are challenges to that. When you have a dedicated device that is procured through insurance, you can know, you have that device for five years. So I'm going to say that again because it's really important. And I don't know why my glare, there's like a glare, I apologize. When you have a dedicated device that is procured through insurance, and that could be Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, 
Um, you have that device for five years. Some states it's seven years. Minimally, it's going to be five. And the reason why it's so important to make sure you have the type of specialist that Patty mentioned, where they're going to do that comprehensive assessment and do what's best for your loved one, is if you get a device that is not a good fit for your loved one, you're stuck with it for five years. And I have had that time and time again where people say, I was never trained on this device. We did the assessment, it came, and then we didn't have any follow-up therapy. I didn't have any training. And so if you, as the communication partner, are not trained, then your loved one is not going to be able to effectively use it. You have to have those wraparound services. Patty, did you have anything else to add? Yes, I, I will add something that I've experienced in my career about the difference between dedicated devices and non-dedicated device is, especially for those AC, AAC users who get very savvy about communicating. So I have this really fun game that I want to show you on my device right now. But in order to talk about the game, I have to back out of the game and get into my communication software. And now I've said what I want to say to you on my communication software, and I have to back out of the communication software and get back into the game. And I probably lost the part of the game that I want to show you, or maybe it's a movie or maybe it's a picture. It could be a number of different things. So my thought is, is that again, it needs to be very individualized in terms of there may be individuals who are using other types of devices for recreation that they uh -huh. want to be able to talk about that device. And that's where having a dedicated communication device can be very helpful in that type of situation as well. Yeah, and, and actually, Patty is absolutely correct. So what the technical issues that I'm having today is 100% related to that. The, the um, iPad that I use is a dedicated communication iPad. It only has communication and assistive te technology apps on it. Just trying to access Zoom on it has been such a challenge that I could not do the regular functions because my job, we use Teams. So I could not do the regular functions of casting, technology, um, switching from Zoom to another app because it, it, it has not been set up that way. Now you can, you can do, it takes a long time, but you can um, get Wi-Fi on these devices and then you can have access to email and you can have access to um, uh, environmental controls where it actually functions as a remote or turns the lights on and turns the lights off. So all of those things can be set up but it takes a lot of time and it is also individualized. So troubleshooting can be a challenge. So this is why you have to have an experienced clinician to support you with that. Great point, Patty. And I'd like to add right now, while we're talking about troubleshooting, I would like to very much thank Saray today. Saray had an incident that was beyond her control. And she was racing to try to get home in <laughs> order to uh, participate in this presentation today. And she is not at home and she doesn't have access to everything that she needs to have access to. Thank and uh, I'm going to put Saray on the spot a little bit now mm -hmm. and ask her, um, Saray, what do you think if we made a, a little video of the demonstration that you were going to do? Yeah. And that we could email that to Whitney and Linda and that they could provide this to uh, the okay. individuals who are attending. Yeah, I would love that. Today. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Happy to do that. So we apologize for that, but I think we all know that life happens sometimes and, and this was out of our control today. Yeah, I'm actually in my brother's basement uh, <laughs> because I couldn't get home in a timely manner due to due to a, a, a situation. So thank you. I appreciate your flexibility. And yes, yeah. I'm happy to do that. That'd be great. That'd be wonderful. We'd be happy to share that. We do have some more, um, a few more questions. Um, one is, um, what are your thoughts on communication partners also using a speech generating device to model use? We haven't done this, but we hear it's recommended. 
So that seems to be getting a thumbs up. <laughs> yes. And Patty, again, jump in. Um, so yes, you should absolutely, if you should communicate in the language of your family member. So just like if I, if I was a, a individual who used ASL, if I was deaf and I use ASL, if I, if my family's not using ASL, then I'm not going to have anyone to communicate with. It's the same thing for AAC. You should you should model one that device if they allow you to because it is their voice. You want to get their permission to model on their device. If you if they don't want you to model on their device, you can take a screenshot of their. If you have high tech device, take a screenshot of it, print it out, laminate it, and model on that screenshot. Right. So and when I say model. I mean, if you're talking about going outside, we are going to play. So I'm saying it while I'm touching it. That's an evidence-based practice called aided language stimulation. And so you want to absolutely model and touch while you're talking and, and hit some of those keywords. We model um, up. So what that means, if, if, you're, if you're a family member is at like the one word or two word level of communicating, um, verbally or via the communication device, then you want to model at the three word or four word level. But you don't want to model at, at six words in your sentence using these complex um, words or, or these complex um, transitions that they're not going to understand. So just slightly above where they're communicating is what you're going to model. But yes, model, 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 either on their device or low tech device. If you have access to another high tech device that has this, that is the exact same system, then do that. But I would not recommend you go out and buy that. That can be very costly. If you already have access to it or you're granted, you get a grant for it, that's great. But I, it's not necessary to purchase it. Okay. Um, we have, and, oh, I. I agree with everything you said, Saray. I have the exact same thoughts on that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. The next question we have is, um, we want to make my son's device available to him at all times, but we are having a hard time yes. introducing it to him in the classroom. He seems distracted by it mm. and pushes all the buttons constantly without the intention of communication. How do we make the device available to him during class without causing disruption during instruction and other quiet times? Yeah, um, so um, I'm not sure, and I would love to, um, like if you want to send, uh, ask the expert follow-up, Patty and I can get more information. So it really depends on how long he has had access to that um, communication device. If this is a pretty new device, I would say those behaviors are 100% normal. It is very similar to when young children who are verbal communicators and have been verbal from birth start learning language. They kind of babble, they kind of play with their sounds. And it's expected that they'll be making sounds even when no one's around or no one's communicating with them. It's the same on the device. They're going to be touching and playing and they'll be a little bit distracted. Um, so you can definitely set some parameters and some boundaries, but the first thing you want to do is show them the power of communication in the school. Um, so use it during some really highly engaging, fun activities. Um, a lot of times we do that with centers where they can go around and they have their communication device and uh, uh, a professional that's there to help them and assist them. Um, give them access to it in a really functional manner and praise them for using it in a functional manner. So I don't like to remove access to language, but sometimes you have to remove this device just for training and give them maybe the low tech board so that they can learn how to use it um, in a more functional manner. So I'm not saying remove it for the full day, but you can remove it sometimes when they really need to focus and let them know. You're gonna have access to your low tech board. I'm gonna this and put it right here just for now. If you need it, reach for it. If you have something you wanna say to me, um, but for now you'll have access to your low tech. So you're setting some communication boundaries. But the most important thing is that he should always have access during fun times when it's not be distracting if he's kind of talking and then provide some communication expectations within the routine that are happening. Cause it's really structured. 
and routine and he has an adult to assist him, I think you'll see a decrease in those behaviors. Um, that explicit instruction um, has to happen where he's getting that really intense training. That has to happen in every environment. So if he's not really getting training, he's just doing what children do. That's normal. Uh, Patty, let me know if I miss anything. I would just like to reinforce a couple of the things that you said. One thing that you said I think uh, is is really key is understanding that this is a communication method. And just like you would not be allowed to interrupt the teacher by raising your hand or giggling or clapping your hands or making lots of noise, how would you deal with that situation if your child were interrupting instruction in that way? And you would deal with it in a very similar way. And also with the speech generating devices, the volume can be really helpful sometimes. And there are times that maybe you don't remove the device, but maybe you turn the volume down during a situation and say, you're using your voice on your device too loudly right now. The teacher is talking. It's time to be quiet. Mm -hmm. So we're going to turn our volume down on the device. And I, I have a, a little quick story in that I have uh, in, in clinic here at the university, a little one who just started uh, with his device. And we had a lot of unintentional, well, let me strike that. We had a lot of playful language, I should say, and a lot of explorative language the very first week. And the favorite word became Cheez-Its. And I think I heard the word Cheez-Its, I don't know, maybe a thousand times in that first week, Cheez-Its, 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 over and over and over again. And then once we got into week three, we had very intentional, purposeful language. Open door, no open, I go. So again, it's almost, I love how you said this, Saray, uh, going through this babbling, explorative um, period that, that we go through developmentally when we're learning language. And we want to support the individual through that stage. And then in terms of providing whatever kinds of limits, behavioral support, um, that's appropriate based on their, their developmental age. Mm -hmm. And I know we're um, short on time, but this last question that's here, I think is really good and I want to squeeze it in there. Um, sure. How, how young is too young? Our son is nonverbal and four years old, but developmentally around 10 months. We recently adopted him and we've been told he's too young to use any kind of AAC device, but yet we know he recognizes the family iPad when we take it in the car. Mm -hmm. and knows it has the music on it, which he loves. Do you feel it's appropriate to be assessed? Yes. Um, and so you want to be really cautious with who assesses him. Um, but yes, uh, they're at, at age four, um, even if he has what they have described as, and oh, as speech language pathologists, we're very cautious with using age equivalents. But even at the, that level that they've uh, uh, communicated to you, he's very capable of using communication device. Now, it may not be a grid-based device. So a grid-based device um, has the squares and on the video, I'll make sure to make that distinction. Um, it has like squares and you're pressing picture icons that have words. Um, we have new technology called visual scenes that works really, really well for some individuals that um, can't yet use grid-based um, systems. And so what that is, is you'll take a picture of a scene, like maybe you'll take a picture of the classroom and during circle time, it'll be maybe a picture of your child sitting in the classroom and, and the seat will say, this is circle time. And what and it is, he's sitting in the circle and then there's another, he'll hit another location and I'll say, we are getting ready for fun. And then it's like, good morning, Mason. Right, so then you you and the teacher will work to, to pre-program certain things in that device so that he can functionally participate. You can put millions of visual scenes in there to help him communicate throughout his day. At home, on the playground, in the cafeteria. I've seen, I've seen wonders with uh, children who can't yet use that grid-based device. They may do very well with visual scenes. And they also could do well with a tactile based device. Um, there's just so many options. So those just are two of them that I'm thinking of right now. 
and, and I will add to that, think about what is highly motivating to them. Sometimes it's snack time. So maybe it's a picture of the snack drawer and all the different snacks and that you're selecting a snack visually based on an actual picture of what's available in the snack drawer. Or maybe it's um, favorite toys that I can't quite reach, but I know that they're there and I want to be able to request whatever that favorite toy is, whether it's a bubble or a train or a doll or whatever. Yes, yeah, participating. Absolutely. Yeah, participating in their highly motivated activities, motivating activities is the most important thing. Also getting them to participate in those very familiar routines, super important. Um, and so sometimes it doesn't come in a dedicated device. I've had success with like a wristband that has picture icons on it um, for kids who want to participate in some of their um gross motor activities, rocking back and forth, swinging, and then they have a wristband and they can use almost essentially picture exchange. Um, sometimes we use what we call a mid tech device, like a Big Mac, those buttons um, around the classroom and they can access that to access language. So it, it, can, it can look very, very different, but you want a really strong SLP and assistive technology team to assess his skills and find the best uh, needs for him. So if they're telling you no, they're probably not the team to do the assessment. I would keep looking. One last thing I wanna clear up about that uh, is that Saray mentioned that you can only have, purchase a device through insurance every five years. However, you can be evaluated more frequently. As most insurances allow evaluations as frequently as every six months, if you're going through insurance for an evaluation. So if you feel like you haven't gotten what you need, try again. Mm -hmm. And you can also, uh, even if you get that, uh, that dedicated device through the insurance and it's not a good fit, you can also get an assessment through your school team. When you request that assessment, they, they legally have to do it. All right. Well, I think we're just at our time. Um, I want to just take a moment to thank Patty and Saray for sharing your incredible expertise. Um, today with us. It was a fantastic presentation, some really great questions. Again, in the chat box, there is the link to the Ask the Expert um, submission form. If you have a few personalized scenarios that go with your questions, that might be helpful. If you think of questions after the fact, um, please submit them through there, and Linda and I will be happy to pass them along to both Patty and Saray. Um, and Patty, I don't know if you wanted to just share a little quick thing about this QR code. Yes, we would love for you to participate in a survey to share what your experience has been so far with CDLS and AAC. Uh, the survey will take you around 10 minutes or so to do. I've provided the website here as well as a QR code. Uh, thank you for helping uh, contribute to our knowledge base. And thank you to my partner, Saray, who has had a day and has been <laughs> absolutely so wonderful in sharing uh, her knowledge today and every day, and especially thank you to the CDLS Foundation. I appreciate all that you do, and uh, it's a pleasure again to be here with you today and reach out through the Ask an Expert if we can be a further assistance. Great, thanks, and we will be sending yeah, out that I QR code as well to through right. email for those who may not have been able to grab it on the webinar. Yes, thank also, you, everyone. Yeah. Also, this has been recorded, and in the next few days, it will be posted on the CDLS USA website under webinars. So um, if you want to re-listen to parts or you have family and friends who could not listen to it, it will be available. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the week. Thank weekend. you, everyone.